and then it's a lot like teams, you know, and then, but it's going to show mining.
Good morning, everyone. We're just waiting on a few to join. We'll get started shortly. Okay, we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, bear with us. This is kind of a new training that we, we're starting. Um, and we're hoping it'll help you guys out. First of all, I wanted to go ahead and see this is really going to be focused towards our single sided um, center based programs. If there are any in here that are a multi sided entity, let me know real quick. Okay, I think it's mostly just our single sided ones. Um, um, I, I regret that we haven't done anything like this in the past. I think it'd be very helpful, especially when every year we have new changes on our application. I think it would help you guys um, with, with filling out the pro, uh, application and that whole process. Uh, before I get started though, my name is Kathy Riddell and I am the director of CACFP here at the State Department. Um, and we are looking forward to having lots of new different types of training throughout the year that I think you guys will find beneficial. Um, this being one of the first new ones that we're gonna be implementing and we'll try to do this. Um, it's gonna be a continual thing because we want our new participants coming on, having some guidance on how to complete the application. So um, we have them scheduled the first Tuesday of every month. So if you don't get your questions answered today um, and you still need help later, there'll be more later on. As you have questions, I've got some other ladies in here with me, our CACFP group that uh, many of you may be familiar with. 
Lisa King. She's been with us for a few years and we've got some newbies with us as well. We've had a lot of transition in our um, office in the last several months. We have Jennifer Pryor um, and she just came on. She started Tuesday, Tuesday. So she's just jumping in head first. And then we have Karen Davis. And some of you may have already spoken with her. She's been with us for a couple months now, maybe. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So most of you probably have already inserted your new application for the year. What was you? Thanks, Um, When you log in, at being single-sided entities, you are going to see that you only have one business associated with your login, unless you happen to be one of those that I don't think we have any of those types. So where you may have be the owner of several different centers um, and you would see different businesses listed here. We're going to be testing with our test top pop account. That's what our center is called. Um, and when you log in, you want to go select the business that you're wanting to complete the application for. Something that we always encourage, there's many of these things on this page here that you guys aren't able. And keep in mind, I'm logged in like I'm one of you. So you're, you should be, what you're seeing on your screen when you log in should be the same as what we see here for the most part. Um, it's always important to make sure that you're keeping all of these things up to date. We find folks get frustrated because um, they're not receiving our emails or if we're sending information out. And all of that comes from this page. So if we're sending you anything in the mail, it's going to obviously where your mailing address is. Um, and it's usually going to be directed to the person that's listed here. So if you're having issues receiving any of our um, emails or mail out, check this page first. And if that doesn't solve the problem, give us a call and maybe it's, it's something else that we can help with. Okay, so we're going to go into the applications. I have already inserted the 2021 application, um, but if you haven't yet, you simply just put in the fiscal year here and click add renewal and it'll insert it for you. The reason why I asked if we had any others um, on today that weren't, that were not single-sided um, is because we're really going to, today's going to be focused on the forms that single-sided institutions have to complete. Um, and there are some additional ones for multi-sided and uh, we will have time at the end if there's any that will need that guidance. Um, otherwise, if there's not, we'll just stick to the ones that all you guys are used to completing. The first application, the first document on your application is our application questionnaire. Um, and like Many of you probably know um, you've renewed before. Um, I don't think we have, we may have a few brand new people in here, um, but there's many of our forms that when they roll over, um, it goes over pre-populated from the information from the year before. And those things could change. And especially maybe these questions about if you've ever participated. And we see that a lot, that when you first come on, chances are you may not have ever participated. And then we let this go forward from year to year and it never gets changed. Um, so make sure you're reviewing every form before you submit it and that all, all the questions are answered appropriately. And like I said, this one being the main one that we see, um, if you are renewing an application, you have participated in the last seven years and you need to mark which one. Same thing with if you're a school, if you're with a school district, make sure you're marking these that you do the national school lunch and breakfast program and what have you. Um, generally, these other questions about if you owe money or things like that, hopefully they will say remain no. Um, and then make sure you're completing this number five. Um, like you um, already know, I think it was last year we just started that, Lisa, where everybody just gets cash in lieu? Yes. Okay. And so now you don't really need to put anything here unless you're a school. And so that's caused a little confusion. You don't get a choice as a daycare in, in CCFP. You all get cash in me now. So, but if you're a school and you receive commodities, then you can mark that here. And any of you that are in here with me at any point you want to interrupt, 
interject something to it. Okay, that's a pretty easy form. The funds received form, everyone has to complete this. It's a simple form, but I think it causes some confusion. Um, total CFDFP funds received. We are looking at the last fiscal year. And what a fiscal year in this program is October to September. And right now you guys are filling out an application for 2021, which starts October next year. So technically the number that should be reported in this number or in this in this field should be the money that you have received from us from October of 19 until September right now. Um, so it might be kind of hard because you all haven't, you haven't done your September claim yet. So really you can only put up to what year to date. So that's okay, as long as it's from October until current and that's what you're putting here, that's, that's what should be put there. Now on your total other federal funds received, the information that should be going in that box is any other money you receive, obviously that are federal funds. That includes Title 20, um, tribal money. If you're a school, you get Title I. There's lots of different types of federal funding that you may receive, and that has to be reported there. The one thing that causes confusion is this right here, the date of last audit. That is not referring to when we've come out and done our, what we call administrative review. If you are an entity that has received a, a public or a private nonprofit entity that's received $750,000 or more dollars in federal funding, federal funding in the prior year, you're required to have an organization-wide audit. And that's an outside entity that, you know, that comes in and does an audit of your finances. That is not our state audit that some think that we're referring to. So if these two numbers here don't add up to be more than $750,000, then per our regulations, you're not required to have an outside audit and you do not put a date here. You would leave this blank. Likewise, if it does, you have to list the late, the last audit that you've had. And then some of you may or may not, with our single-sided, a lot of you don't, may not ever reach that threshold. But then if, if you are one of those that it does require an outside audit, um, our office will reach out. Um, the total funds received amount pertains to all federal funds received from any federal entity. Your, your CACFP funds up here, that's where those go, and then anything else, including tribes or whatnot. But if you've received like the, um, what's that loan, the PPP loan or yeah, whatever, we don't need to know about that. Um, you, you do not have to include that there but it would be any type of other funding. And like I was saying, if, if you do require one, um, then Becky Gray, she's our lady in the office that handles all those audits. And I'm sure if you've had to have one in the past, she's reached out to you and, and asked for it, so. Okay. Meal policy statement, there's really not much to go over on, on this form. Nothing about it, it has changed this year. You essentially just say you agree to it and move on. No. You mean like the uh, COVID or anything COVID type funding no. Okay, our civil rights assurance and compliance review. This form last year was sort of a nightmare. <laughs> and I think that we've made it much better this year. As you may recall, if you were completing an application last year, we asked you to, you know, you guys have to have annual training every year. And one of those topics has to be civil rights. And we have that training available to you. Um, and if you, we can look at it later if any of you have questions how to access it. We got the new one posted uh, last week, late last week. 
So if you've not taken, taken that training yet, you need to do it before you can um, lawfully complete this form and submit it because you should be doing your training before you say you've had it. But last year, none of these questions here have changed. Um, review them, make sure that nothing in your circumstances has changed. But number five, if you recall last year, number five was four or five blocks of long, and you had to list where the training was and what the topics were and who attended. We don't need that. Um, all we need you to do is click that this box, basically certifying that you have taken your training for the annual civil rights and that you understand that you have to maintain that documentation on file and it will be asked for um, during your administrative review. Um, everybody in your institution that has anything to do with the CACFP, your cooks, um, even down to your teachers serving the meals, they have to have the annual training and they have to have the civil rights training. So you need to conduct that and get it done. But to satisfy your application requirements this year, you just check this box and say, yes, I've had it once you've completed it. These two questions were added new last year because um, we weren't tracking very well if we had any participants that needed anything provided to them in any other language other than English. And um, we do have some things uh, translated into Spanish, but that's the extent of it. So just make sure um, you're answering that. We know that the response mostly uh, is going to be English. And the form will say that you don't put anything there, but we really need a response there, even if it is just English. Don't let us assume that it's English. We got to know. Yeah, it won't. We won't approve the form unless there's a response there because we can't assume. And this one's tied to that. If there's any if there's any type of um, form or handout or what have you that we have that's not in a language that you feel like you have participants that need it in that language, that's where this needs to be listed. Last year we didn't really have, I don't think we had anyone respond anything other than Spanish and we have those materials. So any questions on this form before we move on? Just to clarify, last year you had to send in your civil rights training certificate. You can still send those in if you choose, but we don't need them. So it's not a requirement. The requirement is that you keep them on file and they will be asked for during the review. Public release verification. Oops, I get click happy. After you have participated a year, you can opt in to the, um, oh, it's not on there, because I'm, well, I'm working on a brand new, it's a brand new test entity. Um, but those of you that are renewing should find a box somewhere right about here that says you want to allow the statewide release. And you can do that and you're not required to do any other public release if you check that box stating that you're going to allow us to use you in the statewide release. Um, once application renewals are done, usually end of November, 1st of December, we will generate a list of all of you that have checked that and we will submit that to a, in our own public release of all of our participants. So that is not required unless you actually do some type of um, publication and then you'll want to list it here. It's only required of our brand new participants that they have to do this. So if you, if you have one that's been rolling forward for years and it's just been sitting there from when you first started, delete it. We don't need it there if it's old. You have anything else to add on this one? No. no. Um, the state agency and institution agreement, there's really nothing to go over on this one. Um, nothing has changed. You basically, once you are approved and you come on the program, this rolls forward approved every year because it's a permanent agreement that you will um, follow all the, 
policies and procedures of the program. Um, I think the only thing we've really changed in the agreement this year, and if you come to one of our manual trainings, it will be discussed there, um, but it doesn't really pertain to you guys. It's about our brand new participants. We're going to be re requiring training before you come on. So you don't even have to submit this one or anything. It rolls over submitted and approved. Okay. Owners and board members. This form we changed last year. Um, and most of you that are in here right now on this training will probably only need to fill out the owner portion, unless you're a nonprofit. And then you will fill out this part. If you're a school, you will not use the owner section. You will use the board section. So make sure you're filling out the appropriate um, areas. There might be very few situations where you have both an owner and a board. And in the event that happens, we'd need to know both. But I think the vast majority of our single sided centers, all you need to do is put in the owner. We did add another selection here. So if there is multiple owners, um, list them all. Because it's important that we know everyone um, that's involved with the operation of your program. Okay, and one thing I wanted to mention too, that if you do have a board, um, no more than 49% of the board may be um, those that are receiving compensation or family members by blood or marriage. So make sure that you're um, in compliance with those policies. Any questions on this form? Disclosure of lobbying activities. This form very rarely is completed other than, um, do they have to put their name right there? I, I don't think they have to. I, I, no, they I, think some, I think some folks do, um, yeah. but you really I'm just really have to submit it. If you're not doing any lobbying, which I don't know of any, maybe we have some nonprofit activist groups, but most part of, of you guys aren't doing this and that's perfectly okay. Just submit it as is. That brings us to our application for participation is the big one. The one that we probably have the most um, corrections on. And we've got some changes in here too for this year. Um, so everyone has to fill out the application for participation and many things from the year before, if not everything on this form rolls forward. Um, last year, we've changed this. Last year, you would, it was, it list, it's a name of responsible person at center or something to that effect. We changed it to where you're actually listing the name of the director because we understand there are times when you have an owner and, it, and a, an owner may have more than one center and you've got the specific director assigned to those centers. So we need to know the owner. And we also need to know the directors um, when those are different individuals. And that comes into play more often when you have multi-sided institutions. So just know, whereas before we asked you to list the responsible person and their title, now we're just asking you to list the director. Um, this is grayed out for anyone that's an independent site because you're not under a sponsor, you're operating as an independent institution. Um, it is our regulation, it's USC regulation to participate, that to participate in the CCFP, you either have to be licensed um, by DHS or you have to be exempt from having to have that license. So if you're an entity that is operating and you're not licensed by DHS, we have to have some type of proof that that's okay. Um, and we're working on a process to help make that 
easier for folks, but I, I think generally everyone in here is going to be licensed facilities. Um, if you're not, and after this training have any questions about that, you can speak up then and we can help them. Um, most of you are not going to be participating in any other state. If you're single-sided, you're right here. Um, and most of you are just going to mark none of the above, unless you're specifically a public school. I don't know that we have any private schools on, really. Um, and we have plenty of drives. Your type of institution um, generally wouldn't change from year to year. Um, it's important to make sure that right things selected because this is how that most of you probably already know that if you're a propri proprietary by Title 20, you have to enter those numbers in on your claim. Um, and those things are looked at and you have to have the contract renewal and, and what have you. So um, make sure that one's marked. Whereas if you're just solely free and reduced and, and you don't, you're not qualified based on Title 20 or you're not Title 20, you want to be proprietary, free, and reduced price eligibility. And for those of you, yes, sometimes we use terms that aren't, most of you probably know, but Title 20 is DHS subsidy, if you weren't aware. And we do have to have that renewal contract every year. And we are aware that right now, um, last we heard at the beginning of this week, DHS hadn't released how that was going to be done. I know last year you had to go to a website and go through a process to get it renewed and that's not ready yet. So just know that that is not going to hold up your application approval for this year. We got the application out so much earlier than we have in the years past that it's rare that we're ahead of other agencies. So we're excited about that, but unfortunately we won't be able to get that uh, renewal for some of you. Um, before we approve, which means we'll have to come back around later and bug you about it if it's missing. So just know if we approve you without it, be sure to get it to us when you get it. Um, your type of facility is where we're going to change um, either, but there's not really much to discuss about that. One thing that we have folks sometimes will check this because they don't understand what outside school hours and care center mean. Um, this really doesn't pertain to, we have very few that legitimately, legitimately are outside school hours care center. Um, and these are just centers typically that are unlicensed um, that are caring for children when school's out of session. Um, so sometimes it's going to be maybe a school that participates that way, that it's a, a school district that only goes four days a week. And so on the fifth day, they pro provide that care. It would be something like that. Or if they are open on spring break or something like that. Most of you are not going to be this. Um, we understand you take care of children before and after school, but that's not what that means. I don't think we have anybody in here that is at risk. If you are, can you please say so in the chat if we have any that are participating in at risk? Okay, we have a few. Okay, okay, cool. Well, I didn't want to just skip over it all together. So, um, oh wow, we got several. Okay, then I'm not going to skip over the at-risk stuff. Um, your at-risk has, there's very specific qualifications for you to participate in at-risk. Um, and there's really only one way. You have to be within the attendance area of a school that's at least 50% free and reduced lunch. And we look at our own um, low income report that comes from our school side to determine that. You guys get those email, emailed out. And most of you are familiar with it if you do the at risk or if you're a school. And once that determination is made, once you apply and we determine, yeah, you're within that area, um, that, that determination lasts for five years. So once that happens, we'll enter the date here and then five years from that date it expires. So just know that if if you see that your your expiration date's coming down to you don't you don't have to send it in um, but just get with us and, and work with us to make sure it gets updated what will happen if it does get missed um, you won't be able to claim 
you'll just go to your claim and it'll say it's expired. So just make keep an eye on that when you're doing your application every year. Um, I think we have a group that's going to be coming up, quite a few that's going to be coming up uh, that'll be expiring this year. And basically we just have to, if you've not moved locations or anything, um, your, your map and all those things that we have to have won't have to be updated. We just got to look at the current, most current low income and make sure that you still within that um, percentage. Um, the one thing that does have to change and it has to be submitted every year for any of our at-risk programs is that we need the school calendar. Um, and we also need, if you're a school, and the class schedule. Because if you're serving like before the end of the day or what have you, you have to have so many hours of educational hours and all that. So those are two things that um, do have to be resubmitted every year and we'll ask for. Um, emergency shelters, we only have one in the state. You can't even click this if you try because you have to have special approval to be an emergency shelter. But we have to list it there on our application for sure. Any questions about the at risk before I move on? Okay. Um, age range of enrolled participants, make sure you're updating that. Um, it can be from zero to 13, basically. It can't be at zero to 12. The day they turn 13, they can't be on the program unless there's a documented special need. Um, your license capacity obviously goes here. If you are an unlicensed facility, which it sounds like we have some schools in here maybe, um, you will not want a license capacity. It should be zero. So um, make sure you're putting zero there. And if you notice, actually, I think it defaults. If, you, if it says, if you are not licensed and you click no, yeah, it zeroes out. Because we don't want you to list the capacity you might have a building capacity or something to that effect. Well, I'm sure you do, but we that's not what we're talking about. So we don't want to list a specific license capacity when you don't have a license. Um, and for schools, I should make a disclaimer. If you are an unlicensed facility and you're not a school, that's when we need the additional documentation from DHS. But if you're a school, you don't need um, that letter from DHS justifying that you are caring for children in an unlicensed scenario. Hours of operation, that's an easy one. Um, those of you that are schools that are on here, sometimes that's a tricky thing to put because if you're doing the at risk, you're only going to really need to list the hours that you're operating the program, um, which is generally at the end of the day. For most of you that are just regular daycares, um, we need to know your, your entire length of your hours of operation in your center, um, especially when you're serving meals all day long. So that at any given moment, while you're operating the program, we should be able to come in and see and observe and look at your paperwork. So just know whatever you have listed there, we could show up at that time and we would expect you to be there. Yes. Yes, that's correct. And I'm sorry that it, sometimes we get our brain stuck solely on keep referring to child care because that's the majority of our participants. But yes, adult daycares also have to have a license through the Department of Health. Yearly. Yearly. Those expire. Okie dokie. Um, dates of operation. This is one we get, we see a lot of errors on and we have to kick it back and have you guys change it, um, especially for our school systems because schools operate on one year and we operate on another. Um, but if you're renewing your application, we want your dates of operation to be so that you're eligible for the entire year. And our year is 10-1 of whatever year to 9-30 of the next year. So even if you're a school um, and you started in August, and you ended May, don't put that. Put October 1 of 2020 to 9.30 of 2021. Those are the dates you want so that you are eligible and open to be, you know, you're eligible to participate at any time during that fiscal year. The only time that these would change is if it's a brand new facility or a site coming on. 
and then your start date would be whatever your effective date is. Um, same thing with your um, days per week and per year. I mean, if you have a very specific set amount of weeks, which schools tend to do, then you can put that. But unfortunately, we've all learned there's an exception to every rule and situation because of COVID. And we're, we've had schools operating in some capacity all year long. So, you know, the point is, I can't find my stat, it went away. Hold on. Number of meals has to be at least one. Are you talking about in the meal time where you're trying to enter the meal time? Well, you'll want to put, like, are you trying to put a higher number and it's giving you an error and it won't let you? Let me. Hmm. But look, so see, I've got I've got zero here because I said no, and it just let me insert it here with eight hundred. So, did you make sure this this was set to no? Because that's the that's the key. When this is set to no, it turns off that, and it will allow you to put a maximum number of meals here. So make sure this question is set to no so it turns that off. If I were to say yes and leave it a zero, I probably will get that error. Okay, cool, that worked. And that's what you guys, hopefully some of you are like able to kind of walk along and, and do some stuff as we're going. And if at any point something like that happens, speak up. That's what, that's what this is for. Okay. Where was that? Okay, so this um, S here, this used to be where you guys could check it yourself, but we turned that off so that we have the control of what months you're approved for um, because it's directly related to your claims. So yeah, they can't even see it anymore. And so <laughs> we just made it disappear. <laughs> so upon approval, um, we will go in and uh, approve what months you're approved for. And so many of you experienced this, well not many of you, everybody experienced this because when COVID happened and nobody, we knew, we had no idea what was going on. We just went in and took everyone's months away for, what was it, April, May, and June? Yeah. Because we just didn't know how to get a hold on who was operating and who, and who wasn't. So that's why you guys had to call in. We just went and took those months away so that, that if you were claiming you had to contact us and let us know. And so we knew what was going on. We still don't know what's going on, but we tried. <laughs> it was our it was our best effort. We're doing the best we can. So we're not going to do it that way um, for the next fiscal year. We're going to prove everything is normal. We know that there's no telling what COVID could bring and what could shut down again. We hope everything can operate as normally as possible, but especially with our schools and our at risk that can operate maybe in, and there's some other scenarios where you can operate in a different capacity because of these waivers we have in place from USDA. We're not going to document that on the application like we did last year. Um, if for any reason you're going to be operating any differently than you normally would pre-COVID, um, 
we have waivers in place for that and you need to contact us and let us know. But if you're going about your daily business as usual and serving kids as usual, and it's, you know, how you're serving is reflected on this application, you're good. So with that said, we're not gonna take your months away. We're just gonna approve you all as normal. Um, this right here, do you serve meals to participants in shifts? I think sometimes that this um, question is misunderstood. It's literally if you have more than one serving time and you're serving for at, like breakfast two different times for a specific reason. It's not to allow you to claim over your license capacity. It's not to accommodate anything other than the fact that say you have a group of kiddos that come in early and you feed them and then they go to school and now you have another group of kiddos that come in and have, you know, eat later. Yeah. And so it's, it's, it is not explained very well, but that's what it's for. And, and when you click yes, it wants an explanation and um, we don't always get the best explanations. It should be for a scenario kind of like I um, described, or, you know, it could be, I um, serve my infants, or I serve my younger kids later and my older kids earlier, what have you. That's legitimate, but, oops, I don't know what I just did. How do I make that go away? Okay, let me go away. It was on my screen. I think we have a question and I don't know how. I'm not sure. A participant, if you had, I saw someone raise their hand. I don't know if it was on purpose or not. Oh, really? Oh, no. I'm trying, I think I have everyone muted and I'm trying to figure out how to undo that. Oh wait, I figured it out. Hey, I, am I unmuted? <laughs> can you hear me? Okay, I can hear you now. Okay, okay, quick question to refer back to when you were talking about how we're running our, I'm a childcare center, I'm Angie Clayton, I have two three-star centers. One in Tecumseh, one and more. But I'm interested in like sometimes when the COVID hits your center, you may have to close down 48 hours or something may, um, like one of my peers, they had to close down for two weeks to, because um, it kept going, the teachers kept getting it. So when we're audited or whatever, and like, so we're closed down, we're not doing meals. I mean, are we need, we need to call and tell you that's what's happening. Because obviously we're not, it's going to look weird, you know, when we're doing our claims. And I'm sure that's a red flag, but I don't want anyone to try to shut us off or anything. Well, you know? what I would suggest um, is be in constant communication with your consultants um, because they're the ones that could come out at any given moment. Um, although we're doing most of our reviews offsite, we still have the ability to go on site if, if, and it's really just kind of up to our consultants. So I'd make sure your consultant knows that. If it's ever gonna go longer, if you're gonna be closed more than a month, you know, you can let us know. It's not a bad idea to shoot an email. Most people have just been sitting an email to that CACFP at SCE.OK.gov email and letting us know that way and we are making note of it. Um, but like I said, if, it, if you were just going to flat out not claim a whole month, it'd probably be good for us in the office to know. But I would definitely at any time that you're closed for any length of time to let your consultant know. Does that answer your question? Yes, it does. Thank okay. you so very you're, much. You're welcome. Thank you, thank you. No problem. Okay. I think we got another question, Sarah. Hi, yes. My question is in regards to um, do you serve meals to participate participants in shifts? We do, and the reason I put on the explanation that correct me if I'm wrong or if I need to change something, but yes, because of the number of children in our program, they eat in shifts according to their age group. Is that okay? Yes, that's an acceptable reason. Okay. Yeah. I just wanted to make sure. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions before we move on?
Lisa, I just made you a co-host so you can be able to. Okay. Okay. You're welcome. Thank you. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. Moving on. I'm glad you guys are asking questions. That's what we're here for. And if we need to go back to anything at any point, because I ramble, so if y'all have if y'all have anything, just raise your hand, speak up. Um. Okay. This is one thing that we still need to get fixed. It will allow you to save this form without answering it. And that, I think, will it? I don't know. If it does, it shouldn't. The, will records be maintained on site? Does it allow them to save this without answering it? Do you ever see them blank anymore? It's kind of, it's kind of crazy because, I mean, you have to answer it, but you can't say no. So you just have to say yes. They have to be maintained on site. That is per your agreement. So make sure that says yes. Um, we want you to explain here how your phys your physical counts being taken, and that's a pretty easy one. If at any point you did anything different, or you closed, or something happened during this whole COVID madness back in March when that started, and throughout the summer, this is where we were going back and making notes. If you notice anything other than what this question is actually asking about, let's go ahead and remove it there. Because like I said, we're approving these applications like. We're in a pre-COVID era and operating as normal. Um, here are your meal times. Be sure we slid this one in on you guys last year, and I know you probably hate when suddenly we just require new things suddenly, but we did. And I think it's going to be, I mean, it was intended to be helpful for you guys because I know it's frustrating when you have all we were asking before last year was a beginning time. And we didn't, we've never really said as a state, and there's not a USDA reg that tells us your meals have to be this long or they can't be this long or they have to be during this time period. It's really up to your discretion when your meals are served and how long they last. With that said, it made it very um, subjective to when your consultants come out and you're, we come to observe a, a meal and we have to make sure you're claiming children within that serving time. So if we didn't have you set a specific serving time and we didn't know when the end was, how could we know if you were not, if you were serving outside of your meal time? So that was the purpose of that. So um, you should have a beginning and an ending time. We had a little glitch at the very beginning of the, when we went out with the application a couple weeks ago, but we fixed it. But double check and make sure your ending times roll forward and make sure they're, they're you know, legitimate. Um, it, it does not have to be a set amount of time. It's how it, we need to know exactly how you're operating and that will help us know what we're looking for when we come out to conduct our review. So the number of meals served has to equal the serving capacity? No. Okay. Your, um, for centers or anyone licensed, it should not exceed your license capacity. But for um, anyone else that's unlicensed, I mean, it, it doesn't have to equal your building capacity. We don't ever, we don't even look at that anywhere. It's not recorded. So the answer is no. But you're going to put, you know, basically you're enrolled or your typical number of those participating. Maybe with a little more, because it's hard, especially if you're an open site and you can have any participants. You, you guys have probably experienced that. Um, those of you that aren't licensed, where we have to come back and adjust it because you didn't give yourself enough. Yeah. Yeah. Well, and that's what we're never gonna for your for the license one. It's not gonna allow any more than what you're licensed for. But that's when your shift meals come into play. Because if you truly are serving kids, you know, and you guys know you can't be over capacity, license capacity. Um, that's on you. But that's the point of the split shift and allowing that maximum number. But to answer your question, like I said, I know I ramble. No, it does not have to equal your building capacity. Uh, the, another change we made this year is, okay. I'm gonna get this figured out. Hey, I had a quick question. Uh -huh. Okay, so we're talking about license capacity. So we were always told before that, okay, so if I'm licensed for 120, 
but I do not have any more than 120 on my campus at one time. So I do have shifts of children that flow through when, because we tend to over enroll because not everybody comes every day, but not everybody's more than 120. Does that make sense? Uh -huh. And so I was told before by the food program that as long as I didn't violate my license mm -hmm. by not having more than 120 on my campus at one time, that that was not a problem. So now you're saying that is a problem or? Well, what, no, I, I don't, I, I wasn't very clear if that's what okay. you understood. No, I mean, we, that's why we don't allow more than your maximum for any meal time can't be more than your license capacity should you have one. Um, we know that your enrollment sometimes can be higher than that. And when, when you put the claim in and the claims process, we have all kinds of edit checks in place. So the application knows your license capacity and they know that it knows that that's your, that's your limit. But the claim records your enrollment and it's understood that your enrollment could be higher than your license capacity. And it compares those two and it takes the lesser of two basically. And, and I bet you don't even know all that. That's way too specific. But the way you're doing it, I know some have been told before, if you have split shifts that they recommend putting, if you're licensed for 120, put 60 on one shift and 60 on the other. No, per regulation, you can have more than one shift of any meal and none of those can exceed your license capacity and as long as you're not outside of your license capacity at any given moment on your campus that's what we're concerned with so the meals could go above the 120 because if i'm serving well it technically on the claim because if you have could. more than if you have more, I have more enrollment is that what you're saying versus yeah. the license capacity? Yes. okay if you have more than one shift and you have more enrolled in your license capacity when yes okay i'm so sorry thank you does for that make sense okay yeah it does right. okay okay um clarify that i think it's school site because i know it's yes okay so uh are you are you with a school that just asked that question? Winstead. If you are, if you, um, in those situations where you're an at risk, um, you don't have a set license capacity and you don't necessarily have an enrollment. And in that situation, yes, um, you will just list how many you had signed in or how many you served. Does that answer your question? Yes, ma'am. Are you talking to me? Or are you talking to her? I'm so sorry. Oh, no, it's okay. That's okay. I was, we're in the chat. Um, okay. Question, You're talking to somebody else. So, yeah. okay. I don't need to worry about it because I'm not nope. a school. I'm a daycare. Okay. Nope, perfect. <laughs> yes. Um, Jemaya, I don't know if I'm pronouncing your name correctly. If I'm not, I apologize. But it sounds to me, okay, so she's an at-risk. And that's the case with at risk. They don't necessarily always have license capacity, nor do they have a set enrollment. You're counting basically who was served. Okay. Any other questions about meal times? Just know that if you ever go to claims and it gives you some type of capacity error or something to that effect, nine times out of ten, it's directly related to the meal times and and the maximum number of meals you've listed. Um, and if you don't have a meal time listed, then you can't even claim that meal. It'll tell you, sorry. Okay, we changed this um, because nobody uses directions anymore. <laughs> um, so we took, we just changed this to be comments now. However, with that, every year the your directions to your facility rolls forward. So you can just delete that out or, leave it there, we don't care. But we thought this would be, um, we just go ahead and keep the section B and change it to comments so that if there's anything you need us to know about how you're operating um, that will help us better identify or serve you, put it here. Um, especially like if, you know, our daycare centers, it's not so hard. We know, we know where you're at, we know what your serving times are and that every kid in the facility is gonna be fed. Whereas if you're a school, 
and you're running an at-risk program, you've got a big, you know, you've got a big school, a big site, we need to know what room are you in or how are you operating or things like that. Or if you're a school and you're partnered with the Boys and Girls Club and you're, you know, things like that that can help us find where you are. I can't tell you how many times that we've walked into facilities trying to find an at-risk program and the people at the front desk at the school when you say I'm here, you know, on behalf of so-and-so for this meal, they look at you like you have three heads because they have no idea that, that maybe they have that program and the meals being provided. So just something in there that will help us know how to find you and what's going on. And something else I just thought of, the purpose of the program for at-risk cannot be to feed the children. And it can't just be enrichment and it can't just be educational program like I know our box here is limited on what you can type and we have a whole new form for you to fill out to accommodate for that now. <laughs> and we'll look at that. But just give a brief description. The purpose of this program is, is of your program is not to feed the children. It's to do some program, but because you're doing this enrichment, you're allowed to also feed them and claim it on the at-risk program. So moving on. Section C, yeah, you guys know how to answer this, if you're private, nonprofit or not, if you're a Head Start. This is one here that we see often not answered correctly. If you are renewing your application, this answer should not be no. If you're, uh, if you're a school and you participate in an SLP or what have you, this answer should not be no, it should be yes. For everyone renewing, it should be yes, and you should give it doesn't have to be explicit, like I started on the CACFP on August 16th, 2016. Just say, I've been on since this year. Um, just so that we know that you are returning and how long you've been on the program. If ever it was with a different entity or you were under an, with a different name, you'd also need to provide that information there. Um, section D. This is one that we get probably some errors on too. Um, meal at preparation service location, that's what most of you are. That means you make your meals there in your own kitchen. Some of you might be, um, you, you might have a central kitchen where, and this is really just gonna be our multi-sided institutions, which I don't think we have any, or schools. You might just have one kitchen mm -hmm. and, and that meal doesn't come from the site, it comes from the kitchen, you would mark that. But really, you're only going to mark just one of these. You, one site can't be more than one of these. Um, is there anyone in here that is contracted with any type of vendor or school system to provide meals versus preparing the meal yourself? If not, I'm not going to harp on that. This one right here, this selection actually has nothing to do with meals being prepared. We just didn't have a better place to put it. But if you're contracting with an outside entity to help you with anything concerning your food program, um, whether it's to be help you create menus or help you with your accounting or anything like that, any type of consulting type service, services to help you with the operation of your program, you need to be selecting this and you should have a formal and approved contract for those entities. Um, total number of participants enrolled. This is where Lisa, I may need you to chime in. Does this, this is their actual enrolled number, but does it compare it back to their license? No. No, okay. No, it, it does tie to the ethnic and racial. Okay. Oh yeah, it's tied to the ethnic and racial, okay. Um, so this only comes into play really, you have to put your number of enrolled, everybody's got to list your number enrolled, but only your profits for profit sites are going to be completing this section. Um, and we kind of have some weird glitches with it. It's like once you some numbers get in there, you can't take it out. So if that happens and you're not for profit, don't worry about it. Um, we disregard it anyhow. But just make sure that according to how you're approved, whether it's um, Title 20 or you're just free and reduced applications, this is where you enter that because as you know, um, for childcare centers, um, for our for-profit sites, you have to be at least 25% free reduced to participate. Our nonprofits, that does not apply to you. Okay. 
this is another big one. This is where we ask you to list um, the responsible people within your organization. And you have to have, and it is kind of a confusing form, I will give you that. Um, this top section is those related to program related duties. So this is going to be your cook or your janitor or what have you, uh, teachers that serve meals. I mean, it, you have to have someone that's doing program related duties. But you also, we can't approve it if you don't have anybody listed as doing your administrative duties. Somebody has to be responsible for your paperwork and your claims and what have you. Right, and so it, you're putting the name of the position, not, not the person's name. You gonna... Title 20. Title 20, don't worry. That's for daycares. Title 20 is DHS subsidy, so that does not pertain to any school. You guys have different title money. Disregard. Okay, so you will put in um, food. <laughs> That's a bad example. <laughs> and however many you have, maybe you just have one. <laughs> Generally, folks come in here and fill this out and put them all up here. But you have to have one that has the admin flag. And in order for that to occur, you have to fill out this one down here. So it would be director. I can spell. So we would not approve this if we did not have one with the flag here. Someone has to be responsible. So this is one that we almost inevitably have to have corrected. And that one person sometimes, if you're a small um, facility, might be doing all of that. You might be cooking and serving and everything, and that's fine, but you also have to be doing the admin work. So make sure you're getting that in there. This brings us to our ethnic and racial breakdown. This probably confuses people, especially on the bottom part. The top one is your actual enrollment. And you really should be updating this every year. We've noticed that from year to year, if we go back and, and look at some folks from year to year, they don't ever change. But it really needs to change with your current enrollment. Um, and you're really just marking them per observation you know if, if they don't want to report it and unfortunately as far as USDA and this program's concerned there's only five options to choose in your racial breakdown and we all know that um, some kids fall into more than one but you have to pick this one the predominant one the best the best observation choice you can make and this number has to match your enrolled count that you listed up there in F C. This bottom section is supposed to be where you report your potential um, service area, like the potential eligible kids in your area. You can get that from a lot of different ways, but the, probably the easiest way would be to get it from your local school. Um, oh, so you, okay, so we do have someone with a food service company. Did I include only school personnel in the food service? Um, I mean, you would want to list who's doing, not necessarily, but ultimately the person who's listed as the admin person, it has to be a school person. And that's what we're concerned with. Um, yeah, we, or there will be a recording of this that we can share later. But we're going to have this screen. There's another one on the 16th that you can join. And then we're going to have it on the first Tuesday of every month going forward. So we'll have lots of opportunities.
Yes, Sarah. Okay, on the enrollment, we're at risk, and I had a question. Our kids change for like the, we get sometimes kids that we haven't seen, you know, from the community in a while, or so we, it's hard to keep up with their ethnicity. Do we write it down each time we get a new kid? I don't know how to go about that. Well, you're only, you're only reporting it at the beginning of the, the, beginning of the fiscal year. So what, okay. we're just gonna do it for what's right now. And it, it's hard for you guys that have um, a fluid group of kids that are participating versus a center who theirs are enrolled. So just do the best yeah. you can in the situation. Okay. Yeah. Okay, yeah, because our enrollment changes all the time, our number oh, yeah. of kids. Okay. Yeah, it, whatever it is, the day you're completing the application will be good enough for us. Okay, thank you so much. You're welcome. Okay. So like I was saying on this bottom one, these um, really, this down here should be coming from your potential area and the easiest way to get that would be from your school but you can also go look it up in the census data there's other ways um, if you have issue finding those numbers just holler at us and we'll help you out. oh yeah yeah we have that on the our yes and our SE website under public relations or something if you just search for the ethnic racial breakdown, there's a report that you can go and grab it off of that. And the last thing that we have changed on this form is this training section. And it's just so that you are certifying that you understand and that you have completed your annual training. And there are very specific topics in which you're supposed to be trained on. And it's these here. We do not require a certain number of hours. Um, we just are required, you are required to have conducted and participated in some type of training with all your key staff. And key staff is also very subjective, um, but it's who's the individuals that you determine within your facility or your school that has anything to do with the food program. Like I said, it, even if it's someone going to buy the groceries and cooking and peeling the carrot kind of thing. Everyone has to have this training that has anything to do with the CACFC. Um, this training here doesn't qualify. It doesn't meet any of those really words from the application, but our manual trainings that we have, which are the second Tuesday of every month, um, that, that's the training that would, you do not have to come to ours. It can be one that you develop yourself using our training manual or any other materials. Yeah. ICN, um, dot org, yeah, Institution of Child Nutrition, you can go there and there's lots of trainings there. It doesn't have to be formal. Um, it can be just a, a staff meeting where you're going over these requirements and talking about your processes with these. Um, but you have to do that eagerly with all those folks and you have to maintain that on file and we look at that during a review. So we've been noticing that sometimes when we're going out more often, lately that folks have not been getting their training and we don't want that to be a reason that you're you're non-compliant so get your training done so if you check this you should have had your training don't check it if you haven't you won't let you save this form if you don't check it though so. any questions on anything else on this form I think we touched all the hot spots, yeah? Okay. Moving on. If you think of something later, just raise your hand. Um, it sounded like we did have an adult care program in here. Sometimes this form is available, I think, for everyone, meaning anyone can click on it. But obviously, it's only going to be if you provide care for adult in an adult care situation that this is required. So if you're not, um, you really don't need to fill it out. But make sure just like with any of these forms, I mean, they're not in here. They're in here for a reason. We need to know, you know, specifically how your program is operating. So be as detailed as you can in answering these so that we know, you know, how you're operating. Um,
Oh, yes, a good point. So Jennifer just mentioned that um, we need to answer them for a normal day, non-COVID days. <laughs> If something's changed about how you're operating because of COVID, we have something different and we'll reach out to you. We'll need to reach out to that one that responded that way and we'll have that documented in a different way. Um, but just answer these how you would normally operate on a typical day. Um, same thing for our at-risk questionnaire. Uh, we had you guys do this at Renewal on paper last year. That's a true statement, isn't it, Lisa? Yes. Okay. <laughs> so if you're an at-risk, you had to fill this questionnaire out, but now we've finally got it in our system. Thank goodness. And you will not be able to submit your application unless you answer this, and we answer it with responses that qualify. Um, and the, the couple that are really, like, you, you have to have an organized and regular activities in a structured and super, supervised environment, and you have to have an education or enrichment program. If you're multi-sided, which I think we've established none of you are, but if you were, you'd have to list if they were different, which site had what activities. But don't just put tutoring. Don't just put feeding the kids, because that doesn't qualify anyway. Tell us what we're looking for. This, you know, I speak from experience because I've been out in the field and conducted reviews. And if it just says tutoring, which in many of your defense, before all we had was that tiny little box and there wasn't a lot of room to put anything, and you might really be tutoring, um, and, and that's the extent of it. But help your consultant know when I'm walking into your facility, how am I going to identify what this program is that the at risk is being used for? So that's what we're asking for here. Let us know what we're looking for specifically. And one thing that we get a lot of times is um, athletic groups that want to be able to see their participants. And this does not ex exclude athletics. You just can't have the at-risk program solely for the football team or what have you. It has to be open to any other children. I mean, it, you know, it, especially talking about schools. You can't just bring on the football team because they need to eat after practice kind of thing got to be open to any of the participants. And your education and enrichment activity has to be available for all the children. They, the catcher is they don't necessarily have to participate in it. It's just got to be offered in there and available for them in order for you to serve and claim that meal for them. So we are looking closely at these, but if the answers aren't detailed enough or specific, we will come back and ask you to elaborate. Any questions so far? Okay, brings us to our favorite form. If you are multi-sided, you don't have this form. You have a different budget. So if what you're seeing is confusing to you because you've not filled this one out, um, when this is over, if any if anyone wants to stick around, we can look at the multi-sided one. Otherwise, that's going to be the focus on our next training on the 16th. Okay, the budget is probably the most confusing form, um, and we have limited training on it, provided limited training, and we hope to change that. Um, we've kind of restructured our office, and we're excited, and we've added an, an additional director, so now that we have a director of CACFP and a director of NSLP, and now we have a director of training that can devote a lot of time to creating some new training. And so we're hoping that maybe some budget training will be one we'll see coming very soon. Um, we know that this form is confusing and that it needs some help, and we're hoping to work on that this year as well. But one thing to keep in mind is that the budget is a projection of what you intend to use our money for and what it will cost you to run this program in the fiscal year. Doesn't mean you're going to get additional payments or you're going to get that money that's in the budget. It's all in how you spend your reimbursement on what you can use for any of these costs. And I think that's the most confusing thing. So for those of you um, 
on any of you, any of your reimbursements that you receive each month, only up to 15% of that can be used to pay for any type of administrative um, or any other cost other than, you know, your food and food related costs. Because this is a reimbursement program. That's where the majority of your money should, should be going towards. However, we, we understand there's a lot of costs involved that isn't necessarily just paying for the food. Um, and that's where this comes into play. And it, in order for you to use these, um, use the funds to pay for, you know, parts, you know, hours of your teachers who may serve meals or um, office supplies or things like that, it has to be in your budget because if you don't put any of those things in your budget and they're not approved that way, when your consultant comes back around and they're looking at your expenses and you, you're using, you know, our funds to pay for teacher salaries or uh, utilities and it's not approved you will not be able to count those into your expenditures so like i said it's got to be reasonable reasonable amounts that are put in here um, and if you you're looking to tell us you know how much does it cost you on an annual basis how much does your center pay for and how much does ccfp portion pay for um, on our salary, we, we typically, not typically, but always, I don't know that it's really necessarily written down anywhere, but our rule of thumb is the highest percentage that you can use of CACFP funds to pay for salaries is 20%. Um, anything more than that's not reasonable for admin positions. This does not include where you would list your cook, because it would be reasonable that you know, anywhere from 50 to 100% of your cook's time could be paid by using CACFP funds if all they do all day long is just cook and provide meal service. Um, but that's not the case for these folks up here. Um, your director, you guys spend a lot of time doing a lot of different things. So we feel like 20% is a pretty reasonable amount to cash that at. You can list your teachers here. These are teachers who would be not serving the meals. This would be teachers that are helping do any type of administrative labor like meal counts, if they're completing any of your paperwork or things like that. That's where these folks would be listed. Well, that's what is confusing. So the 15% is, okay, you submit a reimbursement and of that reimbursement, and it's calculated on your, your claim for you, it tells you how much is the 15% to let you know. No matter what you're paid every month, of that payment, only 15% of that monthly payment can you use to apply back and pay for admin costs. So that's actually talking about the dollar amount you're paid. Whereas here, this is a projected amount, and you're gonna tell us what the annual salary of these folks are, and no more than 20% of that salary in the whole year can be, um, can you, I, know, I never explain this where it makes sense, but we're approving projected amounts that can be paid for for the entire fiscal year. Whereas the 15% is 15% of the amount you're actually paid. I probably didn't answer your question. Yeah, I know. That's why we need help on our budget and our training. Let me see if I can go pull a claim. It's okay. I know it's confusing for us up here. So let's just talk about, forget the 15%. Okay. We're going, am I unmuted? Okay. Forget about the 15% right now. We use this as a cap about how much of the overall amount per year that will allow you to use our funds to pay for any of these salaries. And as long as you don't ever exceed more than 15% of your entire reimbursement, you're fine. That doesn't make any more sense either. But, because <laughs> then I go down here and, and if you list your food service people, you can put 100% of their salary right here, right? The budget has nothing to do, your projected budget has nothing to do with the 15%. Because 
we could approve you to pay for a, I mean, say we did, say we said 100% of all of these, 100% of everything, that's great. We could say use our funds to pay for everything under the moon. We can't do that. But if you don't make, if your 15% of your reimbursement isn't enough to cover that, it's a moot point. You see what I'm saying? So it's really kind of an arbitrary budget and it's just a projection. You're telling us how much it costs to operate your program. And when we look at these salaries and how much we're gonna approve, we're saying as a state agency, we feel like 20% of their salary should be more than that, that we'd approve that you can use our funds. If at the end of the day, you had enough left over. Because generally, you know, a lot of our folks don't necessarily have 15% of their money left over after they've went and bought their food and their supplies. It's just saying that when you receive our reimbursement every month, if you have some left over, you can use that money to pay for these things approved in your budget. Does that make it any more clear? Okay. That 20% is just a cap we use because nobody, well, I shouldn't say nobody, but folks aren't spending 100% of their time in administrative labor. You guys have a lot more hats than just the UCSD. Same thing goes with your administrative expenses. We kind of try to keep it at that same rate. Um, but you know what, if you had, if you could justify any of these things to be more than that 20% and you have a methodology for how you're coming up with, you know, printing office supplies and communications, you can use our money, you can use the ACSP funds to pay for those things. But it can't just be all of it because you use communications being your phone and your internet um, for other things. So it has to be a reasonable methodology for why you're saying, look, it cost me, I spent, you know, it should be kind of based on last year. So last year I spent $5,000 on, on these things. And then you're gonna put how much your center portion paid for and how much of it actually was used towards the CFP. Um, so it's not gonna be all of it. Yeah, you know, if you're multi-sided, multi you know, mileage would be something. You can even count the mileage for um, going to pick up your groceries and things like that. But you guys, if you're transporting kiddos and things like that, it's not going to be all of your mileage because you're driving for other reasons. You just have to justify what portions and why, because when your consultant comes out to look at it, we're going to verify that you haven't gone over those approved amounts. Yeah. Okay. So part B is your projected CCFP operational cost. This is where you're going to list your folks who are serving meals or um, cooking the meals. So if you're wanting to charge off, you know, the two hours a day for your teachers or what have you, I'm just making that up. Um, you know, you can, because if you are bringing the meals to the classroom or the, they're taking the kids to the lunchroom or what have you, when they're spending their time to serve the meals and clean up, those are all food service related costs. And you can use this money to pay for those costs if you have money left over at the end after you've paid for every, all your food and whatnot to charge off and use that to help pay. That's where all these things go. In part C is where you are going to record your sources of income. So um, the intent of this program is that you operate a nonprofit status program. And what we consider a profit is more than three times, um, three months worth of a, a, a reimbursement. So if you're over what you would normally receive back in reverse reimbursement for us three times for three months, you would be considered in a profit status. And that could make you, or it would make you non-compliant. And it potentially can result in, an, in a serious deficiency. The point is for you to receive this reimbursement and use it for approved costs. And we know many of you are not making enough to cover your cost of food, unfortunately. But anyway, this is to calculate, after you put in your income, it will calculate if you're um, within, within that. I don't think I'm set up to the right kind of 
I'm set up as a nom. Does it not? Mm -hmm. Okay. Oh, it just estimates whether they're negative or positive. Okay. You enter in um, all your income. Many of you are just going to have your DHS or private pay, whatnot, um, if you participated before. It's going, this number should somewhat kind of match what you put on that funds received. Um, and then your federal funding, if you receive any of those same things that you listed on your funds received, you should have a number here too. That's your Title 20, Title 1. Uh, oh, yeah, your Title 20 stuff goes up here. Sorry. Thank you, Lisa, for pointing that out. Um, tribes, um, schools that receive Title One, any type of other federal funding, or if you receive grants or donations or what have you. Um, we need to know it's not going to be exact. It's a projection. And it should, um, you know, with that said, you want to kind of inflate it a little bit than what it was last year because we all know that um, inflation. So the whole point of this is for us to know what does it cost your, your institution to operate this program and whether or not you're in compliance with, you know, being a nonprofit status and that you're also financially viable. We don't want to see that you're operating this program is causing you a great deficit either. Um, so basically, as you guys all know that if when you put in those figures and you it calculates that if you're in a loss, it will not allow you to proceed. So this form forces you to show that, that you have some type of profit um, because we don't you know, we don't, that would show that you're not financially viable, and that's another requirement of this program. Any questions on this? I know that I've butchered that trying to explain it. Okay. Um, financial viability means that you can maintain operations without our money. Um, yeah, yeah, kind of. We know that's not always the case because every month is going to be different, but basically, um, but COVID, you know, I have no answer for that. COVID has messed <coughs> everything up. Um, unfortunately, People, things are, not everybody is operating on top right now because COVID has hurt a lot. Um, but, you know, you're still operating. And the point of the, the matter of it is, is that you still have other funding that's helping you stay afloat. And so we do have to verify that you're financially viable, meaning you don't have to have our money to operate this program. That's, that's the most literal explanation of what financially viable means. Um, so, and in the, and we understand that there's cases where it's cutting it pretty close, especially when, Tammy, are you from a school or are you yeah. a daycare? No. I mean, because the truth of the matter is, this is a voluntary program. And it does have very special and specific requirements that have to be met in order for you to participate. But as a daycare center and as a school, um, you have to feed children to be in compliance with other things. And so you have to be doing that anyhow and be financially viable. You should be able to do that without the reimbursement of this program. but we know that this program helps you guys a lot. Any other questions? Okay, um, one major change that you'll see now is that you can no longer click this, this upload or view uploaded documents button. We've decided and may regret it um, <laughs> to manage these ourselves. Um, because it was kind of getting a little, going a little haywire. Um, you guys may have already experienced that. Um, 
there were certain documents you could upload and some you couldn't. And so then sometimes you would accidentally upload them as the wrong thing. And then it would be there and then we'd call you and say, well, where's this? And you'd say, well, I already did it. So we're just gonna get in there and take care of these documents ourselves. But nothing about what's required of, with these documents has changed with the exception of that civil rights training certificate that we added last year. That's not required anymore. Your DUNS registration, um, you know, you guys need to be keeping up with that. You can see on your... Uh, you really don't. I'm thinking. Yeah, there's school. You really, as far as this application purpose goes, you wouldn't really need to. Because what we're concerned about is what it costs you to operate the program. And in some instances, especially with COVID, in schools, I know specifically, you guys have a lot of volunteers right now that are helping you make stay afloat. Well, let's go back to it real quick. You still have, even though you may have a lot of volunteers, you still have someone that plays the role as the director. It might be your superintendent. Are you, I, I'm assuming you're a school. Are you a school? At risk. Um, what's your program's name? You're a nonprofit at risk. But you're not a school. Do you mind sharing what your program name is? Just so I, I, I want to answer you appropriately. If not, we can look you up on this end real quick. Maybe look her up and that my name. Okay, well for nonprofit at risk if you're not if you're not a school. Um, you would still need to list the person that plays this role. The reason I was saying like I was trying to give examples. Um, that would be your superintendent. Okay, so you would still need to list the director, your, which would be like um, your executive director or what have you. And you would still list any salary that those people are paid, but you'd put 100% center portion and 0% CACFP. We still need to know about those people and that there's those doing those administrative jobs. Because if you list it on your application for participation, that one person that's doing those administrative responsibilities, you need to have at least one person here that's in your administrative labor that's conducting them. You may not use a bit of our money to pay for them. And if you're that person, a volunteer and gets paid nothing, you just put zero. But we still need to have that person. Well, that's stupid because you can't list their name. I guess so, but we don't list volunteers though, but in your situation, do you have a responsible person that's receiving a salary that plays the director role? Because like with the school, it would be the superintendent or the food service director or something like that. Not currently. Um, you know, maybe afterwards we can get your information and talk to you directly. Because like I said, there's always different scenarios that this, this budget doesn't always fit everybody's scenario. So let's talk afterwards. Since the meeting is being recorded, can you? Yeah, yeah, we can send that out. And that's why I'm saying uh, hopefully throughout this next year, we're going to kind of re not during the year, but maybe this time next year, we'll have a new budget that makes more sense and that can be more applicable. If this is set up to really, it's really directed towards centers. 
even down to the wording like director, assistant director, what have you. We're hoping to have one that makes more sense for our nonprofits and for our schools. Yeah. Okay, yeah. We will we will share that with you. Mm -hmm. We might are they Karen, you know, were they posting the Zoom meetings in the cars, the school ones? I can't remember. We I don't know if we'll post it if we email it out, but we'll provide it to you. But like I said, for some of you that aren't a center and that this makes better sense to you, really just kind of have to put it in places that make sense. And the point of the budget is so that we know what it costs to operate the program um, and whether or not you're using any CACSP funds to do so other than paying for the food. Publicly, they were just emailing them. Maybe it's, okay. Okay. We'll find out and we'll get it to you one way or another. If not, just the Q and A. Um, if you were, I mean, it depends your situation. Are they doing paperwork? This top section is only concerned about the person, the people, whoever is doing the administrative labor. And the administrative labor has anything to do with um, the paperwork, the claims, the application, any of that, not the food service part. The workers and your cook, um, if they're volunteers and it's all zeros, I mean, if you're not paying them, then yes, you'd put zeros there. But I'll tell you that if any point during the year that were to change and you're, and you're able to, you bring on pay, you know, as a nonprofit, sometimes you can, um, and you try and you use those funds to pay for those things and you've got zeros in your budget, that would be a non-compliant finding if your consultant came out to see that. So because it is projected, just because you have numbers here doesn't mean you're necessarily obligated to pay them anything. It just means in the event that you have the money to pay them, this is what you're approved to pay them. Is that a little more clear? Okay, good. Okay, so yeah, I um, it's whatever is what do you what is our Let's see what y'all's preference, fax or email. Either way, fine. Whatever you're accustomed to, to it's going to come to us. Yes, um, we have the CACFP email, um, and we're all actually back in the office. We've been teleworking since March, and just like just yesterday, I don't know the days run together anymore. We're all back in the office, so yeah. So if you fax it, we'll have access to it right away. Um. But any of those documents, you know, your certificate of authority and driver's license, that does not need to be renewed. Do not send a new one every year. Um, we require those, even if your driver's license is expired and you get a new one, it's, it's fine. We don't need it, we have what we need. Um, if we're ever lacking something on one of those, or if you, we'll contact you. If you ever have a new person that needs an account, that's when you'll need to send it. Um, but what I was saying about your duns and stuff, you guys, um, we get this a lot where, um, and DUNS has seen, SAM.gov has been taking their time. I don't know if you've experienced that, and I know we're going to blame that on COVID too, but people have been having a tough time getting their DUNS expiration renewed. So don't wait. You know, the date, the date we have listed here is when that date comes around, that's when your access to claims will be cut off. 
and there's nothing we can do to go around it. So if you see that your date, your expiration is coming, start on it now. But we do have to have that document uploaded as well. And you'll just back or, or email that to us as well. Okay, any questions about any of these other, some of you may see different things depending on what type of um, entity you are. If you are a 501c3, it is required that we have the 501c3 on file and that we will verify that it's still a valid 501c3 every year. Um, let's see, child care license, obviously, if at any point something about your child care license and that kind of is an easy one now because they made them permanent licenses. Um, but if you change locations or if you change, if you become an LLC and your license number changes, if anything about your license ever changes, we have to have the updated license. Um, and this is another one. It's always going to say no training records unless we have some type of training records on file. Um, so because you, you've attended this training, and you've used our system to sign up, it should now when you go to your, your account and we mark you as having attended, it'll show up. And like I said, this training doesn't cover um, all of your topics. It kind of would cover part of your record keeping, but just a very small portion. It's just the, the application side. Okay, we'll get it. We'll, we'll get it when we get done with here in here and get it uploaded. And just keep in mind, though, on Tuesday mornings at 11 o'clock to call panicked about a DUNS number, it's unlikely that it's going to get taken care of before you can claim. So like, that's why I said keep, you know, it could happen, but it's bonkers right now for everyone I know. But up here, it's just been crazy. So try to help us, you know, help you keep up with that and don't wait. I forgot what I was talking about now. <laughs> Um, licenses, you guys know that. Um, what else? We talked about the Title 20. If you don't know what Title 20 is, don't worry. Just know that you do still have to get the renewal. DHS is working on that. And if you don't have it before we approve you, we'll come back and get it from you. So we've kind of been using a different process too that I'd like to point out. Um, it didn't really work very well and we worked, we got it working last year, but these over here, and we're approving your application. Um, if there are things that are missing it or need to be updated, we're going to click this little box and it's going to boot out your form and it's going to make your whole application no longer submitted. And we'll put in the details here um, what's lacking. And I can't open it right now because there's no details, but if, and you'll get alerts, and I don't know if you guys, the alerts sometimes aren't very helpful, um, but we're accustomed to when we have communication with you guys. So we're approving your application, something's missing, we're going to put what's missing here on each one of those, and you can come back here and read for each one what, what you're missing. Um, not right now, no. That's coming down the pike. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. We will check that. Yes. Yeah, just wait until if you've already submitted your application, we look at that. Um, and if it needs to be changed, we'll get back with you. But if you haven't submitted it yet, go in there and change it. At any time, guys, you can go in there and change anything on your application. But you need to let us know um, because anytime you change a form and you resubmit it, it has to be reapproved. And not that we won't get to it, but sometimes there's a lot depending on what's going on. So if it's, you know, if you change something, reach out to the person that's working, working on your application or I'm, I'm gonna see. Okay, so this is how you can know who to contact. Um, office staff assigned right now it just says consultant pending but if you didn't know that like that's the person you can call and reach out to if you need something changed or email not necessarily call email is probably better 
Yeah. <laughs> the CACFP email goes to all our ladies. It's a group email. Um, so make sure when you're sending emails to that CACFP email, put your DC number in the subject line so that the person who's working with your application or assigned you can grab it and it's not quite as confusing because during the time, like right now, well, actually, and during all of COVID, it was crazy. And it, so it's easier for us to sort through them if we had the person assigned or the DC listed. I say DC, you're not all, not everybody in here is DC number or AD, our adult or AD agreement numbers. Letter. Whenever we send an email from him, I'm sorry, I missed it. If you did, they will receive something from CACMC. Oh, you mean say, when you use the details? Yeah. Oh, and yeah. It'll just say, you know, check your details. Yes. So, and I, 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 I didn't finish what I was saying here. So when we do that, no, it's okay. Um, when we use this now, and that's what we, we want you guys to be accustomed to going here. So if we go and we click this and say, nope, this one needs help, it's going to unsubmit your um, application and put it back in a pending status. And it, we're going to list in the details what's wrong and what needs to be addressed. It's also going to send you an email and stating that what, what needs, something needs to be attended to. Most of the time it's just going to be resubmit. Yeah, some of them it's going to be that you need to resubmit these forms. If there's something we found that wasn't right and we can correct it, that's fine. But we, per regulation, should not be sitting, submitting the forms for you. So we need you to come back and resubmit sometimes. So if you're getting an email from our system or if you're wondering about your application and wondering why it has not been approved yet, if you see a check mark in any of these columns here, Click on the details and read what it says, because that means it's waiting on you and your response to do something to correct it and then to resubmit. And that's a process that we started using last year and, and I, it works. It works really well, but I don't think we conveyed to you guys well, because we never really did a training like this to explain what you're looking for. So that's one way to monitor maybe the status of your application um, instead of calling, because we get lots of calls um, constantly about you know, I know you guys need your applications approved, but if you come here and take a look first, this might help solve your answer or give you your answer. Okay. I might not get this email or things. May I you? Um, yes. Are you talking about um, on your funds received form or your or on your budget? Well, you're talking about your budget. Okay. Either one of those. So what she's asking is, you guys may have a fiscal year that your program operates on, and it doesn't necessarily operate on our October to September. If you have your own fiscal year that you budget on, yes, that's what you can report in there. Well, are you talking about, hold on. No, this, this right here, if this is what you're asking about, you should be listing your budget year and your budget year does not have to be October to September. It has to be a 12 month span that you use your projected, that's your projected budget. You may use your institutional fiscal year or the calendar year or our fiscal year. I think that answers your question. It's really kind of arbitrary because when we kind when it comes down to it, when we do our administrative review, we're, we're, all, we're looking at one month typically unless you got something going on that makes us have to go further back, you know, and so generally your expenses are fairly similar from month to month pre COVID. I'd like to toss out that disclaimer because none of us can anticipate what the next month, month the next day is going to bring. Um, but yes, we really need you to report what your fiscal year is. Same thing on your federal funds, except for the CACFP one. I know that seems backwards, but just report our federal fiscal year on the CACFP fund. And this is where you can go look on your business maintenance page. This is what your institutional institution's fiscal year is. Um, 
it's from what you ever what you put or whoever ever did your very first application probably but if this isn't right you have the ability to change it and until just last month we never had february spelled right we finally <laughs> for 11 years we had february spelled wrong <laughs> so nobody noticed so if this isn't your business's fiscal year change it because it does it can affect on what your consultant might be looking at what else um it's kind of cool though if you want to submit your training records to us you can um and then this wouldn't say no training records anymore so we have the ability now to say you did a training and you have your agenda and your sign-in sheet and what have you as your documentation you can submit that to us it is not required but if we were to do that and upload it, then it would show that you had training records. But like I said, it's not required. If you're checking this box, well, we have to check it that we've reviewed it. It's reviewed when you're when you get an administrative review. Yes, I we sort of talked about that already, but make sure this is the right person and the right email address. When we send out mass emails, it grabs this one, this email, but it also grabs the email addresses from your user account. Um, so when we set up your initial user account that what you use to log in and the email you supplied there, if that's changed um, and you're not the person listed here, that's why you're not getting emails. So I know we've had some frustration in the past um, with people not getting our emails. So if that's the case, um, let us know because you can't get to that user account area. Oh yeah, good idea. Let me, I also want to say this real quick because I, Jennifer Pryor is new and when you go to email her, it's not just, I say E-N-N-I-F-F-E-R. That's Jennifer with two F. These, that's the right email. We've got Karen Davis. Or, I don't know, everybody. <laughs> so these are our ladies, our CSCFP ladies, and then here's me in case. All right, so there's our CACF people if you need. Um, many of you might have talked to Edgar in the past. He's moved on to bigger and better positions now. He's our IT guy now. So if you're used to reaching out to Edgar, um, you still can, but he's probably gonna start transferring those. He better start transferring those calls to us. He's trying to wear too many hats. What else can you think of that is helpful, ladies? Oh yeah, gosh, I'm sorry. So we've also changed, we've changed something else. It's kind of, we were trying to be consistent, but then it, it throws you guys off, or it throws, throws thrown everybody off. When you forget your password or you get locked out or what have you with your account, when we first set up accounts and until last month, we always asked for the last word, your social. Um, but just to be more secure and so that some people don't really want to supply that so they didn't anyways it's just a four digit number so now we're calling it a pin so when we reset your password it's going to send you the message that says it's been reset to your pin and if you're like I don't have a pin it could be your last word your social still the number didn't change it's just what we're referring to it as did. Anybody who's old, yeah anybody have... anybody that came on prior to August 20th it's going to be what you supplied for us as the last word of your social. So, brand new. anyone brand new, we're just calling it a pin. Does that make sense? Yeah, However, um, well, I mean, a couple of weeks, months, if you see that yours is going to be expiring in the next month, I would reach out now because I know that we've had some folks had a really hard time in having to wait. It takes anywhere between a week and six months. Yeah. Obviously, I got like, you know, getting a passport. 
Yeah, I wouldn't put it off. I I wouldn't put it off. I'd start as soon as possible to see that it's coming to expire in the next month or so. And it doesn't hurt if they do it early. It doesn't hurt if you do it early. They'll renew it at any time. Yeah. So I'd go ahead and start if that were me. And for those of you that aren't multi-sided, you'll see this wording. Everyone sees this. But if you're not, if you're single-sided, this does not apply to you. When we get a question on it, we get questions on that a lot of time because you don't have any idea really what it is, except for the buildings of the future. Everybody gets those, but you don't have to worry about it. Something else we've been trying to clean up, and if you fall into this category and we need to update it, we've been trying to, if your entity name and your business, like if your operating name and your business name could be different things because maybe you're owned by a company but you operate under this name, we need to have that listed here. So it should be like AB or like, I don't know, some Baptist church doing business as ABC daycare. We need to have all those in entities listed in your name so that we don't lose track of, of how you're operating. So I think we have a, we've gone through and cleaned up a lot of those. If you've noticed that your entity name changed, that's why. Um, but if not, let us know. We need to update that. Um, okay, so I know I, I've asked this already. Anybody in here that's multi-sided? that has questions on multi-sided forms, we can do that. You can speak up. Um, if you have not had your civil rights training, like I said, this training is virtually done. Um, we'll stay on as long as any of you all have questions. But if you need to do the civil rights training in order to truthfully answer the question on that civil rights training, this is where you can find all of our trainings available right now. And October 1st is our civil rights training. So you can sign up for that one. Or you can do the self-paced one if you're wanting to get on it and get it done. Or if you want to have a group of people do it, you can go to your resource library and do this here and go to the OK Edge and do the training there. It tells you exactly how to sign on there. Uh-oh. We will find a way to get a recording to everyone. Lost power in the building. It's a bad way to start the day. So I would suggest if you haven't already done the civil rights training, um, you'd already plan to be on this training for far longer than what it's going to take. When you hop off here, where'd it go? It went too far. And it tells you exactly where to go and what code to use and everything. And you can get that done, print out your um, certificate that you do not have to send in. But you can, you don't have to. You still have to maintain the copy of it and all your, your folks that need to have that training. It's a PowerPoint you, you have to go through. Um, also in our training, if you feel like you, you know, your power went out and you missed part of this, we have another one coming up on the 16th. Um, we're going to try to figure out how we get the recording sent to you. Um, we have training specifically for at risk. Yes, you have to do civil rights every year and it's a specific training in addition to your other annual training. And we will provide that every year. But I would um, suggest um, if you're an at-risk and you have questions on how the at-risk needs to be operated, we have this training. If you happen to be a multi-sided and have questions just specifically on budget stuff, we're going to go over that on the 23rd. Sure. Resource library. And it's under the training. Yes, those actually were in the process of after we get done here. They don't know it yet, but they're all going <laughs> to help, help me box them up. No, it, we're going to get them sent out hopefully today. Um, and it'll have your little one sheet 
letter in there that tells you any maybe new changes we've made. We really don't have a lot of new updates. I think the biggest one you'll, you might see is that we're no longer allowing donated food items. So that might be the biggest change in uproar we have. Um, but you should get those sometime next week if we're going to start mailing them out today. The, um, it's already though, am I lying? Nope, we have, we have it on here already. We're mailing out the hard copies today, starting today. So your training, I kind of went off path there. And this will tell you, you go to this website and you'll have to create an account, but if you did it last year, then you'll, you should have one. And if you forgot your login stuff, you can walk through that to do that. And then you'll use this code and it will take you to the exact training you need to go through. It shouldn't take you very long. And then you'll print your certificate. What else? This is not a training um, that we're going to be giving. I mean, you'll get you'll get a training certificate from us, yes, but it's not going to be one that you'll be getting ours through CECPD. So you will you will get a training certificate, but it'll just be ours. Um, if you're with a daycare, it won't be helpful for your CECPD hours. But if you're with a school, it can be used towards your professional development type of hours because. You don't have to do the CBD thing. They can, um, um, they can, but you can't count it towards the meals you're preparing. It would just be, um, you can't use it towards the, the meals you're claiming. Because, you know, I, I'm sure everyone in here is familiar, but that's one of the things we look at during a review is that um, you know, not only are you claiming the meals, or not only that you have records and you have all the records for children for all the meals that you've claimed, but we also look to see that you're spending what you're spending your money on and that you're spending enough so that you're not making a profit. And um, we see that sometimes donations and really, um, although we don't want to discourage anyone donating things, it's really affecting your program because if you got a vast majority of your things being donated, um, then you're spending less on food and then you're non-compliant because you're in a profit status and that's not the intent of this program. So I would say your donated food should be treated like extras and you can still accept it, but it shouldn't be counted towards anything as far as a creditable meal. Any other questions? We can go back to forms. Um, if you have any questions on anything in our resource library, there's a ton of stuff. We do have application instructions um, that go over and talk about a lot of things that we talked about today. One thing to know that we have changed the way um, if you are single-sided and you want to bring on an additional site and become multi-sided, we do require you attend training before that can happen. What other class do we have to have for renewal? You don't have to have any class to do a renewal. Um, brand new participants going forward will have to have this class and our CM, our uh, CN manual, our child nutrition manual training. But to renew, there's no other, there's no class that's required. This is solely just to help answer any questions. And, and hopefully some of you, if not all, have been able to walk along with yours. How would you determine or calculate if a program is not viable, even when our budget shows positive flow? Um, that's a process we're working on. I mean, we do that during administrative review. Um, and it's basically just to see that you're not operating in the negative. Um, and, that, and no more than three months worth of your operating expense, essentially. Um, but that, that's, that's coming down the path, too, just so you know. Um, we have implemented uh, um, something 
we're phasing in what's called um, viability, capability, and accountability process where you have to complete um, DCA. So if you hear that term being thrown around, um, we are phasing that in with our participants where you will have to complete that to sh um, show documentation and submit documentation that you are a financially viable institution. Um, so if you haven't heard about it yet, you will, but we're not just going to spring it on you because we're going to have to, we're developing that as we go. But any of our new institutions that come on, we have already implemented that process. Um, so that those will be done that way. And like I said, throughout this year, we'll be phasing in to where everyone will have to have completed that process to show. Um, and it may look a little different for different types of entities, for nonprofits versus a for-profit. Um, and that's where that end of year report will come into play eventually. Um, but it's still a work in progress. So just know that if you've had a review or you're going to be reviewed, we look at that and determine that. So if you're not financially viable, it would have been determined in a review. Um, but eventually that will be part of our um, application process is to determine that. Um, how many require, hours required? To um, are you talking about training? Um, none. There's no amount of hours training. There's not a set number of hours you have to have for training, yet just the required topics that you have to train on. Um, we're still we're still working on that process. Um, there is a very specific form that we will complete. We'll have entities complete. So like I said, we're not going to just throw it on you. Um, it will come. It depends, and that's why I said it depends on the type of institution you are, what will be required, whether it's an organizational wide audit or if it's bank statements or what have you, it's still a work in progress, um, but it is being required for brand new entities. And if you're doing a renewal and you've been with us for a while, you don't have, don't worry about it right now. We, when it's your turn, we're going to break it to you guys all gently. It's, it's new things. USDA and our auditors are requiring more from us. Um, if you were reviewed this year, you experienced that. We are having to maintain copies of everything we look at. My office looks like file cabinets exploded because I just have piles and piles of documentation. So um, if you got reviewed this year, you experienced that. And if you're up for review, at, we, it's for the unforeseeable future, expect that when we're still conducting reviews as normal. Um, other than not coming on site. So meaning we may email you and ask you or call you for all your documentation and we'll look at that off site. We may not do an on site meal review, but we're still doing our reviews otherwise as normal. But other than we have to keep a copy of everything. So don't be surprised when that happens. If you don't have the ability to scan or make copies or what have you, um, we can help accommodate with that. Like what, like you mean like uh, bank accounts or our accounts? I mean, I don't understand your question. Uh, no, no. Like I said, right now, um, I only kind of went into that detail about the financially viability, financial viability because we had that question not to bring on new requirements for you guys. But you haven't heard about it yet because we're not prepared to um, do that with our existing entities. So don't don't worry. Sorry. Okay. So are you saying we're going to have to give copies of our bank accounts that will keep, no, 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 no. What I'm saying for the audit stuff, I'm talking like the stuff we have to look at when we review. Now, if that's what you use um, to verify some of your expenses, say like payroll or things like that, anything that um, 
if you've been, whenever you're reviewed, you have to submit the things that show your expenses. And we do have to keep copies of those per the state auditors. Yeah. So um, at any time, we have to produce records to the, those that audit us, just like you have to produce them to us. And so it is a problem if you uh, refuse it. We don't, we don't like the idea that we're having to collect all these things. Um, but yeah, so say, say if during a review on your expenditure worksheet, you have salaries and the only way you can prove that you really paid those salaries that you used our funds to pay for is with a bank statement. Yes, we would have to collect that versus, you know, like a payroll, a pay stub or something. Like I said, we're going off into uncharted territory here that has nothing to do with this training, but I will be happy to answer any questions you guys may have about that. Any questions on any of the forms that we completed? Yeah, there's safe ways to submit what you have to do. Cancel checks work, yeah. And, and like I said, it's going to also um, vary on your consultant and what what they're looking for and what they're needing to see. And if, if it requires the bank statement, um, but there's safe ways to do that. But if you have canceled checks for payroll and things like that, um, those it can sometimes justify. Okay, so back to the application. I don't want to waste it. Um, participants times that are here on here for that. Does anybody have any questions specifically about any of the forms to complete um, questions that you know concerns you may have before that or that are holding up being able to submit your application? Okay. Um well, I don't see anybody speaking up anymore. I hope this has proved beneficial. If you, um, well, good, I'm glad you do. And at any time you need help, give us a call. That's what we're here for. But we're hoping we can, if one person has a question, more than somebody else does. So I hope this was helpful. Um, stay tuned on the whole financially vi um, viable thing. Like I said, I'm not trying to cause panic and I'm afraid I have. If you've not heard about it yet, then you don't need to worry. Um, we're, we're getting there, so we're not going to spring it on you and require something new all of a sudden you're not familiar with. If you guys don't have any other questions, this will we'll end this. And like I said, I encourage you to go ahead and go do your civil rights training now um, and get it knocked out of the way. Anybody can go in and sign on and, and get that taken care of. And if you have questions, you have all of our email addresses, email addresses, and we'll be looking forward to hearing from you. All right. Thank you, guys. Have a great day.